I welcome the people in the room, but for those of you online, a very warm welcome. I'm Professor Peter Schofield. I'm Chief Executive Officer here at Neuroscience Research Australia. Now, to those of you that were busy reading the paper, I believe I've done the right thing. I've um, worn my pink shirt, and I think I'm meant to stand here and give the entire talk this way, okay? And that would be very good. Um, I may not do it for the entire time, if that's all right. <laughs> I'll do some more later. <laughs> Firstly, I want to acknowledge that we are physically here meeting today on Vigical land, and we pay our respects to the um, elders, past and present, and particularly to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are both with us here or um, with us online. And we acknowledge the various lands on which all of you online are, and we pay our respects to the elders of those particular lands. It is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you all here today for um, something that I started off with a little bit of triviality, but this is not trivial. This is a very important issue. And I know you all know that. So I'd like to really just um, commence proceedings by acknowledging our hosts, Professor Kim Bilbear from NURA, but also president of the um, Australian New Zealand Falls Prevention Society, and Professor Cathy Sherrington, a longtime friend and colleague of those of us at Neura um, from University of Sydney and Chief Investigator on the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in the Prevention of Falls. Uh, the, the society, the Australian New Zealand Falls Prevention Society, knows the need has developed a compelling case for a national fall prevention strategy. And you'll hear more about that today. Uh, with your all of you here, all of you online, with your support and the broader community support, today is the start of a call for urgent and coordinated national action to prevent this epidemic. Now, I'd particularly like to thank our special guests, Dr. Harvey Lander from the Clinical Excellence Commission, who fund the... Thanks, Dana Who fund the, um, the New South Wales Falls Prevention and Healthy Ageing Network. Uh, Councillor Raffaella Pandolfini, um, who is recently appointed Deputy Mayor at uh, Randwick City Council and was uh, elected to council at last um, round, last, last 21, 2021's elections. Um, in particular, thank Professor Jane Latimer uh, of the School of Public Health and Deputy Director of the uh, Musculoskeletal um, Institute at Sydney University who will MC the Q&A session. And as I was saying to Jane, um, I will be finishing my role as CEO at the end of this year. And so this is quite a, a, a very nice little bookmark because way back when I started this role in 2004, um, Jane's twin sister was on the Institute board. So I really feel like um, you've got me bookended. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming and assisting today. I'd also like to acknowledge our key speakers, uh, Bob Barnes, who's come down from Lismore uh, to give us a perspective on falls, falls prevention and the community view. Um, Associate Professor um, Diana Olsberg, welcome. Um, from Uni of New South Wales. Uh, Diana is an economic sociologist, former head of school of sociology and anthropology, and an expert in age and ageism. And again, bringing a lived um, experience perspective. And Sally um, Castell, a provider of exercise programs who's changed the lives of many through exercise in older adults. So thank you one and all for coming and joining us today. And my next task is to hand over to Professor Steve Lord. Uh, Steve is a long-term researcher at Neura, a Scientia professor at the University of New South Wales, and one of the world's real experts in falls prevention research. Uh, at the Institute, we really owe um, our international standing in this area, um, the leadership of professional um, bodies, the engagement with the broader health and community uh, through the pioneering work of Steve. So I'm going to hand over to Steve, who will make a few introductory comments. Steve's online, as you can see. And then um, 
uh, Jane will come up and manage the rest of proceedings. Thank you all so much for joining us today and we look forward to um, an interesting and compelling morning of presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, can you hear me okay? Hello, uh, am, am I, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. So thank you very much, Peter. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure just to say a few words really about the history of the Australian and New Zealand Fall Prevention Society. So our society was formed way back in 2006 and uh, its prime aim has always been to promote the multidisciplinary study and imp implementation of falls prevention initiatives for older people. And in this time, really, we feel it's been the leading body for fall prevention research, policy and practice in Australia and New Zealand. Our prime focus always has been to plan and organise conferences and symposia, but we've also had a key goal of promoting evidence-based fall prevention practice and policy through advocacy and education. Uh, the ANZFPS has worked in partnership with health agencies. In fact, it actually grew out of a formal partnership grant uh, on implementing falls prevention research into policy and practice. And that had funding from the NHMRC, the Commonwealth Government and New South Wales Health. And this funded uh, a program of uh, a research program uh, uh, and also uh, supported two national conferences. And these were both attended by more than 500 delegates and it put fall prevention firmly on the map. And in 2003, we're going to hold our 20th biennial conference in Perth jointly with the World Falls Congress. Over the last 20 years or so, I'd just like to draw attention to several initiatives that have been made. And these include uh, the National Falls Prevention for Older People Initiative that ran from 1999 to 2007. And it allocated $18 million to programs aimed at identifying best practice in fall prevention. The New South Wales Health Management uh, Fall, protection, fall prevention policies were also very effective and they were in place between 2003 and 2018. Uh, the Australian Commission on, of Quality and Safety and Health Care produced two iterations of best practice uh, fall prevention guidelines. And there's a third underway, which actually our society is drafting right now. There's also been continued funding since 2004 from New South Wales Health and then the Clinical Excellence Commission for the New South Wales Falls Prevention and Healthy Aging Network to run statewide and rural forums, webinars, virtual meetings and training programs, and to produce research updates, newsletters, and social media posts. So there's been a lot of initiatives and uh, through the above, significant advances in fall prevention research and implementation have been made. However, we have to say fall injuries continue to rise and the treatment of these injuries now costs the economy $2.3 billion every year. So clearly preventing falls and managing fall related injuries is an urgent health and economic priority. So investing in fall prevention across Australia simply can't wait. So this call to action is for a coordinated approach to tackle this major healthcare issue. Thank you. So uh, thanks so much, Stephen, and what an enormous body of work. Um, you know, thank you for summarising it so succinctly, but also your enormous contribution to it. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jane Latimer, and I'm an Emeritus Professor at the University of Sydney. Uh, and I also work, as Peter alluded to, part-time um, uh, for an organisation that's focused on culture and gender equality. And so you can understand my interest in our launch today because the, there's such a devastating impact of falls on so many older women. And that really matters in the work that we do in Australia and around the world. 
So I'm going to MC your session today, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here as we launch with Neura, the Australia and New Zealand Falls Prevention Society report, and we make a commitment to action. And I was excited when my a friend, longtime friend and colleague, Kathy Sherrington, and Kim asked me to MC this event. As I must confess that now being in my 60s, I have a more than academic interest in this topic. And also being the daughter of a rather impulsive, not to say reckless 92 year old father, I too strongly believe that investing in falls prevention across Australia can't wait. But before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Bidjigal land and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I thank them for their custodianship of all our lands for thousands and thousands of years. So welcome those of you in the room today. And I hear, yeah, there are around 200 people online. So I think all up, we have around 400 people or so attending. And, you know, people from so many different disciplines, from different organisations and sectors, including those from the society, those from the CRE, those from New South Wales Health and the Clinical Excellence Centre and other government areas, researchers, clinicians and consumers. And to witness this diverse collective is really exciting because it suggests to me that if each of you are willing to play your part, working together, a national force prevention strategy will be a reality. We've got a fantastic program lined up for you today. And first, you're going to hear from our leading researchers, Kathy Sherrington and Kim Dalbert, about the Falls Prevention Report and its call for urgent and coordinated national action. Then you're going to hear from Bob Barnes, an award-winning community leader from Lismore, who's been inspirational in raising awareness for falls prevention. Thanks, Bob. And next, you're going to hear from a TV star, uh, some of the ABC hit, Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds, but also an Associate Professor, Diana Oldsberg, about the personal experience of falling and its impact on her life. And then finally, you're going to hear from Sally Castell, uh, a wonderful advocate for positive ageing, about the benefits of group exercise beyond just improving your balance and strength. So what a program. So let's get started. So I call Professor Kim Dalbert, who's a senior principal research scientist at Neura and president of the Australian and New Zealand Falls Prevention Society, and Professor Cathy Sherrington, who's leader of the Physical Activity, Aging and Disability Stream at the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health, who are going to update us on the report and tell us why we need to act now. Thanks, Cathy. Thank you, Jane, and thanks everyone for coming today and supporting us in this important cause. Um, it's, it's really heartwarming to see you all online as well, and we definitely hope that we can um, create something here and, and, and make a change. So we're here today because we really want to call on the government and, 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 and make it very clear why we can't wait um, to invest in false prevention across Australia. Um, false prevention is an important problem. Falls is an important problem in older people. Um, and we have an aging population. Now we have 4 million um, Australians aged 65 and older. And in 20 years, that will be 6 million um, older Australians. And injuries as a result of falls, they, they are a growing problem. And as you can see on this graph, falls is absolutely by far the leading cause for injury related hospitalizations like it's stunning isn't it to see this graph how big that difference is if you compare it to for example transport accidents and um, others that are on there this is for the entire Australian uh, population but if we think about older people um they are absolutely making up the largest proportions of these numbers. We had in 2020, we had 130,000 older Australians being admitted to hospital because of a fall. In 20 years, that will be over 200,000. We had 5,000 people dying as a result of a fall, and that will increase to 8,000. 
And if we think about what will happen today, today there will be 364 older Australians being admitted because of hospital. It is a, uh, because of a fall. Um, it is a huge problem. And we really call for action because it is urgently needed to do something. Um, the treatment of injuries from falls um, in last year came at a price, price tag of 2.3 billion. Um, this is just a price tag in our older Australians aged 65 and above. And there are lots of flow on effects as well um, for ambulance services, people attending ED. Um, if we think about um, today, again, like every two minutes and 30 seconds, there is a person that attends an emergency department because of a fall. Um, there's 1.2 million fall-related patient care days needed for people aged 65 and above. And if we think about the other aspect, like we're just talking about costs, but there is so much more as an individual cost as well um, to the person. If you have been admitted because of a fall to hospital, the chance that you um, will lose your independence is twice as likely. So there is a cost on so many levels that we very much would like to address um, and make sure that there is an awareness in the community um, to, to drive change. Australia doesn't have a national force prevention strategy. We used to have one, but it lapsed in 2014. Um, and now we are calling for a coordinated action because as false researchers, we know what to do. We know what can change this. Um, and we, we know that it can actually reduce this cost by 30% with a quick turnaround, like within 12 months. And if we come up with a well-implemented false prevention strategies, we will have long-term benefits for other aspects of health as well, quality of life and independence of our older Australians. Cathy will talk more about the evidence um, of um, what type of things we can do to prevent falls. But what we know is that for people with specific fall risk, we can have targeted interventions, but the single most effective strategy to prevent falls, and that is what Cathy will talk about, is exercise. And that is across all older people within the community, within residential aged care. So it's time to absolutely take action on this and to practice our balance. Should have done this on one leg. <laughs> Thank you. I'll hand over to Kathy now. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, what a delight to be here with you today. Um, and as, as Peter said, I've been associated with Neuro for a long time, having done my PhD here with Stephen Lord quite a few years ago. Um, so fantastic to have so many people um, with us today in person and online, um, helping us to get this issue on the agenda. Um, so we're going to... Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, so this is has been announced recently. Um, this is an algorithm from the World Falls Guidelines. Um, and these are evidence-based guidelines that have been put together um, and have just been launched in the last month or so. Um, and this involved 100 world leaders in falls prevention. Um, and quite a few Australians were involved in this as well. Um, um, the Australians are shown there in orange. Um, and I think this is a really nice summary of the evidence um, and really helps us think about the different strategies that we need. Um, so it's a bit busy, but just to um, highlight here. So this algorithm talks about falls prevention for everybody. So it talks about low risk people where we're talking about primary prevention. And that's where the information from the um, fabulous Herald article this morning from Jenna Price um, about the need for even younger and middle age people to be doing exercise that challenges balance so such as by standing on one leg um, and so we need really those sort of cultural um, cultural awareness and messages about the importance of exercises that challenge balance and strength 
And then for these intermediate risk people, um, people who are at some increased risk of falls, we really need to be able to deliver tailored exercises um, with input from um, health professionals such as physiotherapists and exercise physiologists. And then for these higher risk people, the recommendation is for a multifactorial falls risk assessment um, to address those other risk factors that we also um, have evidence for that have a role in, in preventing falls. Um, and so to me, this is a, a really useful summary of the evidence and can guide further action. I'm going to tell you a little bit about more about some of the other evidence. Um, so this was from the Cochrane review that we did, um, where we were able to, using very rigorous uh, techniques, we were able to conclude that there was high certainty evidence that exercise can prevent falls. Um, and Cochrane reviews these days get us to turn the result into the number of people ex affected. And so if we were to follow a thousand older people for a year um, without exercise, there would be 850 falls. But with the type of exercise programs that were in the report, there would actually be 195 fewer falls. So really the potential is enormous. Um, falls now are in the World Physical Activity Guidelines, so as part of, um, of this type of evidence, guided by this type of evidence. And so they actually talk about the need for um, exercise that challenges balance and strength um, to enhance functional capacity and prevent falls. Um, the World Health Organization also gives us the really useful global, global action plan on how to enhance physical activity, which I think is also really relevant for falls prevention. So we need to be considering our environments. Um, we need to be considering our systems, our funding and support systems. We need to consider societies and social norms and be promoting this type of exercise and making it normal. Um, and we need to be supporting people to be active with programs and services. Um, so we're just going to hear um, a little bit about the cost effectiveness of this approach um, from uh, Dr. Marina Pinero. Hello, my name is Marina Pinheiro and I'm going to present a study we conducted investigating the value for money of fall prevention exercise programs. Exercise reduced the rate of falls by about a quarter in older people, but do they offer good value for money? To answer this question, we conducted a systematic review. We identified 21 economic evaluations investigating the cost effectiveness of fall prevention exercise programs for older people living in the community. The main outcome of this review was the incremental cost effectiveness ratio expressed as costs per quality adjusted life year gain or quality. So if we were to implement an exercise program, this would be the additional costs needed to gain one quality. So quality is a measure that takes into account duration and quality of life. One year of life lived in perfect health is worth one quality. We use a willing to pay threshold of $100,000 per quality gained, which might seem a bit high, but medications and other interventions are commonly funded under this threshold. This figure shows the main results of this review. The ISAs are displayed in the vertical axis, and the closed circles indicate studies with moderate certainty. So if the payer is willing to pay $100,000 to gain one quality, we can see that most studies would fall below that threshold and therefore would be considered cost effective. So we concluded that full prevention exercise program delivered to all the adults living in the community are likely to be cost effective. This study has just been accepted by the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So please check the full text for more details and more results. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Marina. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, next, um, hopefully we can go on to the next slide. Oh, yes, we can. Um, and here we're going to hear a few personal stories about the benefits of exercise for aged care clients. Everybody says they're a little bit scared of doing yeah. exercise because they haven't done it for a while. Once we show them it's achievable and it can be fun, they stick with it. Yep. The biggest difference I've noticed with mum is her confidence has improved. She has better balance. Yep. And we just extended that over time 
so that eventually she found herself really comfortable to go back to the shops again. So it's just been such a benefit that the, the life that she had, she now has again. You know, even just sitting up now, it's easier. One thing that I'm not surprised about is that the participants, the older people, have just loved having that weekly support from a, a trained carer to do the exercise with. It's worked really well with Dad. One of his biggest fears, I suppose, is not remaining mobile and having to be in a wheelchair or something, which is what his, his goal is to stay out of that, which he's done. He's doing really well. Good work. Yeah, I'm glad I did it, yes. And enjoyed it, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so now we're going to oh, pass back over um, to, to Kim to hear a little bit more. Thanks. Oh, we're not, sorry. I got it wrong. <laughs> back to Jane. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Kathy and Kim. And I think, you know, it's you sequence it so well because we started with the very big picture why we need to do it, the global uh, report um, and then we finished there with a, a personal story but we're going to hear some more uh, personal stories and community-based initiatives these being so important um, and so we've got Bob who's joined us all the way from Lismore his Sunday profile on the Lismore app describes him as a business legend a family man a committed volunteer a celebrated Rotarian and he's currently president of the Rotary uh, Lismore West and an inspirational individual. So it's such a pleasure to meet you, Bob, and to invite you to tell us about the community experiences you've had with Falls and about some of the impacts that Falls have had on your family. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bob Barnes. And I'm a typical Aussie. I've lived in Lismore all my life. Played sport, run businesses, have a big family. Been involved in a lot of community activities. I'm president of the local Rotary Club. I'm 83. I've come to speak today on behalf of the 4 million Aussies aged 65 and over. I'm going to tell you about my friends and loved ones, but they could just as easily be your friends and loved ones. And I want to help give a message to Australia. My wife and I have wonderful friends, Pam and Ian, who live on a small farm just out of town. Pam was a great hostess. She was into everything and knew everyone. But one night in hospital, not long after surgery, Pam had a fall. Things went downhill quickly after that and she ended up in care. This is our friend Pam and her husband Ian today. After the fall, Pam never went back to the farm. It burdens me to tell you that my own dear wife, Helen, became a falls risk. She developed shingles in her eye last February. It really knocked her around and she's still in constant pain. She was on heavy medication and had a couple of busters. But one of, after one of her falls, the ambulance was called. It's unsettling to be in your pajamas at 3 a.m. with paramedics in your bedroom. Now, I'm not an educated man, but I do know falls don't discriminate. And the family soon realized that a tumble could be the beginning of the end. I tried tying a cord from her wrist to my wrist when we went to bed so that I'd know if she was getting up. 
A gate was installed at the top of the stairs. A couple of the kids moved back home and we, and we watched her like a hawk. Things were rough, but we soldiered on and got into falls prevention mode. Trip hazards were removed. We got some night lights. We cleaned up a medication. Fine tuned to diet. And she has physio regularly. Here's a couple of photos taken of Helen recently. As you know, it's easier to put a fence at the top of the cliff than an ambulance at the bottom. So with friends from Rotary in Lismore and Balna, we started an information drive about falls prevention. We learned that 40 Aussies, age 65 and over, die from a fall every day. Out of curiosity, we also added up how many Aussies die daily from car accidents, cycling, drowning, death by suicide, and melanoma combined. It came to 16 in total, just two more than falls. When I tell this to people, they're absolutely amazed. Every, every year, falls cost the country billions and have a huge domino effect on families and the community. You've heard about click, clack, front and back. You've seen drink driving and road safety ads on TV. You've heard about drowning prevention from Laurie Lawrence. You've heard the black dog lifeline and lifeline. And you've also heard about slip, slop, slap. But until our friend Pam fell and didn't go home, I hadn't heard or even thought about falls. It's obvious that falls are a very significant issue, but they don't get significant attention. I said that I'm here today to speak on behalf of the older generations of Aussies and to help get a message to Australia. Well, as older Australians, we would love to see a big wake up about falls prevention. Helen's falls, Helen's falls story is a good story, but sadly, Pam's story is not. Everyone in the country should ask themselves, what will the story be for them and their loved ones? Falls prevention should be the, in the national con consciousness as much as slip, slop, slap, and we should shout it from the rooftops. From Burke to Bulamakanka, from loved ones to loved one, from government to government, until as a nation, we do something about it. What a powerful speech, Bob, and, you know, full of absolute conviction, but also the personal experience and the personal impact. Thanks so much. It was absolutely rousing. And I'm sure a lot of people are really going to get behind the call to action. So I think, Kathy and Kim, you've got your spokesperson right over there from Lismore. <laughs> you might have a few new jobs coming to you, Bob. <laughs> Now, next we move on to someone whom, if you're an avid viewer of the ABTV series hit Old People's Homes for Four-Year-Olds, may no, need no introduction. But Associate Professor Diana Olsberg is not only a TV star, but also an economic sociologist and an honorary research fellow at the University of New South Wales. 
She's highly regarded as a social researcher and public advocate for old people. And Diana, I loved reading about you online. Um, and in particular, the sage advice you got from your four-year-old friend, Maximilian, about falls, where you were quoted as saying, sometimes when I'm walking along and I'm frightened that I'm going to fall, I think, well, what would Maximilian say? Diana, just pull yourself together. <laughs> And I'm sure you've got no difficulty pulling yourself together. So it's over to you, Diana, to hear about your own personal experience of falling. Here I am. I've been an academic for 30 years, three books, hundreds of journal articles in prestigious international journals. But what do people know me as? Being in a children's television <laughs> But, you know, it, it's given me a platform to talk about my own experiences and why I want to broaden the, the discussion and the issue. So um, I'm terribly sorry I'm not going to be able to stay long with you. It's a nightmare of the day today. My ex-husband died the day before yesterday, and yesterday all day I was organizing the funeral because I'm Jewish and Jews, we need to be buried within 24 hours. I couldn't get him buried yesterday, um, but today it's at one o'clock at Rookwood. So I'm terribly sorry. I'm not gonna be able to stay and um, to talk to you, but I so wanted to come here um, that, you know, I'm only here for an hour, but I so wanted to be part of this because this is so important. And it's such a privilege for me to be able to be part of what is going on would you emphasize the importance of falls prevention but i want to talk a little bit more broadly and it's interesting um i was being encouraged to see in the council of aging report on community resilience in the face of major stresses and disasters their attention to the crises in mental health suffered by older people living alone and their social isolation. As a result of lack of personal support, their reduced mobility and greater difficulties in accessing help and support. Now, let me tell you about my own experiences because these pressures, the pressures of, well, what do we do about older people who are living alone? These pressures are magnified beyond belief when you've had a fall. That's why prevention is the most important. Um, so it's not only a threat to old people, but for people of all ages after having had fall. Now, I'm a sociologist, so my personal experiences always very much inform my awareness and research about social isolation as a critical social issue. Having a fall sentences you to social isolation and loneliness, particularly if you live alone, far from close family, but even if you live with family, you can sometimes be bedridden, um, most often housebound, and at best you have limited mobility, certainly limited independence and social isolation. Now, I had had a couple of small strokes which have affected my balance. And late last year, I fell full length in my lounge room. Fortunately, no broken bones. We don't all die um, or are hospitalized. I just was had very bad bruising. But what I realized, the most important thing, I don't want to fall anymore. And I'm continuing to do prevention exercises, you know, it fills my life. I'm three days a week doing exercises to try to strengthen me up because, you know, my knees are no good. I can't get up. You saw me trying to get up from the chair. Anyhow, so I use the walking frame now all the time. Just, you know, I don't want to fall. And despite the fact that they're helping me to strengthen my legs and my bottom and all of those sort of things, I don't want to fall because my balance is very poor. So I use the walking frame either, even in my flat. Now, what I want to bring home to you is the, the loneliness, how alone you are 
after having had a fall. So people don't include you when they are going out to dinner, to coffee or a movie, or even to the beach or to the park. They just don't want the hassle of the walker. Imagine what it must be like for people who are in a wheelchair. There's no room in their car, boot for the walker, or they're old, just like you, and they've got a bad back. They don't want to be able to have to lift the walker into the car. So I want to campaign for greater transport support because transport is what will allow me to get out. You know, I mean, that's what's so important. If only I could catch public transport. I mean, many of you, next time you're on a bus, look at the seats for the disability. They're all low. There are no, um, you know, uh, handles to help you get up. So I can't, I can't go on the bus. I'm absolutely privileged to live in Bondi, that there's the Randwick Waverley Community Transport, who, who brought me here today and who are picking me up to take me to Rookwood, um, well, take me home so that somebody else can pick me up. But not that's provided by the council. But it's so much in demand from people like me who have difficulty getting out that you have to book it two or three days ahead. So any spontaneity in my life has completely gone. You know, I live in Bondi and it's a beautiful day and I think, oh, I, I would like to go down to the beach and I could just walk on the, on the walking frame. And I think to myself, it's such an indulgence to catch a taxi down to the beach and then catch a taxi home. And it's not easy. There are no taxis driving around anymore. You know, so it's not easy. So I'm almost entirely dependent upon the community transport to get me out at all. So I want more community transport. I'm campaigning for more councils to provide these sort of support. I want more shuttle buses to take me to the ferry, to take me to the railway station. You know, it, there's a problem with access. People think, oh, well, you know, we've got a, a ramp. But I mean, I went yesterday to the post office in Bondi Road. There are two steps at a post office. Can you imagine in Bondi where there's lots of older people and, you know, look around, lots of people on walking frames, on those little carts which they drive like, um, I'm thinking about those little carts which they drive like a motor scooter, but I really want a Harley Davidson one if I'm going to have one. But, you know, it, it fall prevention is absolutely essential, but I want it wider. I want it wider because, you know, with all the prevention, I mean, I I'd had my balance was poor. I was doing prevention, but I didn't take it seriously enough because I didn't realise how constrained my life would be having had a fall. So more prevention and more help afterwards. Thank you very much, Angela. And if you've got any friends, pick them up and take them to the movies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. It, that was fabulous. And it was, you, you really made us think about the social isolation and the need to think big, you know, in much more than that. It, 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 but, but prevention is an essential part of it. But you can't stop there. Yeah, yeah. And Kathy and Kim, you have so many brilliant speakers who are so committed to the initiative and things. I think you're going to drive it very hard. So thanks very much. Yeah. And we And thanks so much for coming along today, Diane, with your I just so wanted to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were. <laughs> okay, so now for our last speaker before handing back to Kathy and Kim. But may I introduce you to Sally Castell? Uh, where is she? Oh, sorry. I've got my glasses on. <laughs> there for reading. And, and Sally's a physiotherapist with over 25 years' experience 
developing exercise programs that meet the needs of older Australians. Falls prevention has been a key focus of hers and she's won a number of awards for her work and she leads an extremely successful business called Movement Matters, leading the way in exercise for mature adults. I really like that term. <laughs> Sally, it's wonderful to have you here today to share with us what you're learning from your mature adults who attend your programs and the key issues we need to consider beyond strength and balance for falls prevention. Thanks, Sally. Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, I think people have said it already. Falls prevention is a major problem. Um, and I'm coming from the other side of the practitioner, doing the trying to encourage people to do the exercises to prevent a fall, is what we're talking about. Um, as Kathy has and, and Kim have already said, exercise is one of the most important things we can do from a falls point of view, and research has pointed, pointed, pointed that out. And basically, from my point of view, I really think that exercise is the best thing since sliced bread, which people have already heard this before. But I do know and I believe and I have seen this happen in real life. Um, as we've been saying before, I've been out there in the community for a long time. Um, and I'm really I'm passionate about this idea that we need to exercise whatever the age. And I really do believe people can improve um, and improve anything, no matter what's going on. So I just want to just quickly say that I've worked in hospitals and residential care and in the community, and I have seen changes that have happened because of an intervention that has helped people get stronger, improve their balance and improve their confidence. So this is something I really believe in. Um, improvements are possible no matter what the age. When I'm coming into uh, a lot of times when older people come into my classes or come into a program, the biggest thing that I see is fear apprehension. People really don't believe that they can do things. They are fearful of hurting themselves. They are fearful of things getting worse because exercise might exacerbate, say, something like their arthritis. And so basically, a lot of the time is uh, the exercise program, yes, the content is important to include balance and strength. But one of the big things is helping people really regain their belief in themselves and know that they can do a lot more. And it's so, so encouraging to see what's happening. One thing with COVID that I've noticed, there are a lot of people that we've talked about is social isolation. And one thing that I noticed, we had to stop our classes because of those issues. When we came back, one of the biggest and profound things that I came out with, yes, they recognized they needed to do the exercise. Yes, they knew what they had to do, but the thing they wanted was to be with other people. And that was a very, very important thing. And what has involved is a lot of the groups that I do, it's a big social event. They don't come to me for the exercise. They're off to go and have a cup of coffee and catch up with a chat. But isn't that what life's all about? It is to really allow our bodies to move as best as we can, to be as safe as we can in order to be with others and just enjoy our lives. So falls prevention in itself is a very big, important issue to think about is how can we keep older people active and able so that they can still keep enjoying their lives as safely as possible. So that's what I really try and do is encourage people to, yes, come and do the exercises. Yes, it's hard. Yes, sometimes you can't, you, you can't do everything, but at least give it a go. Have a go. See how far you can do things. And then accept if that is safe, if that is what you can do, just get on with doing things. Because again, as I say, when people come to my class, one of the frustrations I have is people think that they can get well in five minutes and they can just come to a class for about five or six weeks and then their balance is going to improve. One of my frustrations is trying to say to people, look, hang on, it's a lifelong thing. You've got to keep exercising for now and you've got to keep challenging and improving these things. You've got so far, let's keep going. Let's see what else you can do. And even just last week, I was talking to one of my groups um, and I was saying to them, look, how many of you actually um, do exercises at home? And they looked down on the floor and sort of said, um, um, yeah, you just exercise with me. And I'm basically sort of saying, hang on, 
you've got to do it at home as well. It's you've got to think about how it's going to fit in with your lifestyle. So as we've talked about standing on one leg or doing a lot of different, different moves at home, you can implement it into your daily life without having to think, right, I've got to do 30 minutes, I've got to do these exercises. We can do things throughout the day. And some really great research, the LIFE project has shown that that can do things by putting things together in a, in a functional sort of way. So that's where I'm coming from is when I, when my exercise programs, there are different degrees. I have, when people come to my classes, sometimes I see a bruised face. I see broken glasses, sometimes a broken tooth. That's an indicator somebody's fallen down, but they've got the guts to get up and start going again. The other ones that I have with people, and this is the one I'm really aware of at the moment, is people get referred after having been discharged from hospital. So they may have broken a wrist, or they may have broken a hip, or they may have or had shoulder problems. But the big thing is fear and apprehension. People don't really understand that they need to keep moving on and they can move on. So I really believe that exercise programs, as long as they're the right ones for them, because one program doesn't suit all, people can really benefit from reducing this issue of preventing falls. So look, I'd like to, I know we've had two stories already, but I'd like to just give you another story from one of my ladies. Her lady name is Eva. And she's a, she was a very keen bushwalker, all right? And she came to my classes because she thought, oh, I can't do this. I'm frightened of going out and about and what have you. With her being persistent and really keeping going with the exercises for a long length of time, she improved. So now she's out walking out and about again, mixing and matching with everybody, going to do all the social activities. She started at 84. She's 94 now and still is out and about and making the most of her life. And I really believe her, her, her approach to doing exercises diligently and persistently has been the thing that's kept her out there and out in the community. So all I just want to say is my message is really, I've got two or three. One is age matters less. It's what you want to do, need to do, and can do that counts. It's never too late. Anybody, no matter the age, ability, or circumstance, can do something to remain as active as possible in order to stay safe and independent for as long as possible. So all I just try and say to my people when they come is be aware of what it's all about, be alert on everything that's going on and stay active and able because you can do it. So thank you. Thanks so much, Sally, and some really important messages there that I'm sure we'll all take home. So I think that brings, oh, actually, we're going to get, uh, Kim's going to say a wrap, bit of a wrap-up. Uh, try to bring up the slides again. Thank you all for um, helping us and, and sharing the, the story and the importance um, of fall prevention. And as we heard, exercise is absolutely the key strategy, but there's so many other benefits as well to exercise. They're good for our mental health, they're good for our cognitive health. Um, and we absolutely want to make sure that this is absolutely understood as a healthy aging um, strategy as well. Um, and you will see a few quotes here, but I already did a few interviews this morning, and we also had um, the Sydney Morning Herald um, article that came out. And one of the questions that has come up every single time is like, isn't this something that we do and that not the government has to do? And yes, absolutely. There are things that we can do. There are things um, such as doing exercises at home, not just in Sally's classes, um, get up when we see someone get up at, in, in the bus um, to make sure that there is space and, 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 and make sure to collect people to go to the beach. Um, health professionals, you can do a medication review as a GP to make sure that the medications are still um, um, accurate. But we absolutely need the government to make sure that there is um, that the health system is supported to deliver these strategies. That is what we need the government for. 
Um, and that is why our key recommendation is to develop a five-year national prevention strategy accompanied by long-term funding strategies with budget allocation to support the implementation, oversight, ongoing monitoring and review. We have five recommendations. First, we would like to suggest to establish a national false prevention coordination group that is modeled on other countries, uh, such as the US, such as the UK, and adapted to an Australian context, um, based on our own previous initiatives, um, as well as uh, New Zealand. We'd like to develop and implement a five-year national plan for preventing falls that is funded to reach the critical mass of community older uh, people and also those in residential aged care and not just pockets of people but everyone, all older Australians. We would like to engage all levels of government and a broad range of sectors including health and aged care but also transport, absolutely also transport, planning and development and housing. We would like to include false prevention strategies for people across the age, uh, the lifespan in all settings to maximize benefits long-term. And we would absolutely also like to call for greater investment in translational false prevention research. So these are our key messages that we would like to bring across. And um, we hope that today is also bringing some context to this um, with, our, with the stories that David and Diana and Sally have shared with us um, and to help us bring this message to the politicians, to the government. Um, so we created this as a society, but I would also very much like to thank our supporters. Many of you are here as representatives of societies. Thank you so much for, for being here and thank you so much for supporting our strategy and our call to action. And also a special shout out as well to Dr. Harvey Lander, um, who's been um, supporting the New South Wales Fall Prevention and Healthy Aging Network. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a quick final thing, I would also like to say that we are calling um, for expressions of interest to help us um, as, to, to help us implement this strategy. Um, and at the end um, of this uh, presentation, you will receive an email where you can register your interest and, and also interest in keeping informed. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And I think that actually wraps it up today. Some of you may have had questions or comments that you wanted to ask. We actually ran out of a bit of time, but the Kathy and Kim and Dana and the team have told me that if you just emailed any of either of them uh, with your questions, comments, contributions you want to make, they'll get back to you very quickly. So thank you. And so just in concluding, I just wanted to say one thing, that one thing I've learned about driving such important health initiatives and creating change is that you don't need everyone in the world to move this along for you. You just need a small group of committed individuals who will never give up. And that's what I see sitting here today. That's what I see in Kathy and Kim and uh, so many of you I've heard from today. So I think... The future's looking bright for getting your recommendations up in your natural strategy when you harness the absolute commitment and dedication that you have here. So thanks for inviting me here today.